next week we are uh, going to be finishing up our first segment of this um, series we've been doing on First Samuel called Looking uh, Into the Heart. And uh, what this Samuel saga has been doing uh, for us is giving us an opportunity to look into the heart of God's people and their desperate need for a king after God's own heart. And so uh, this week we're going to be looking one last week here at Saul here. His kind of segment begins to close after this week and we're going to pick up David in the new year uh, once we get back into this series. But kind of a last um, real segment on uh, Saul this morning. And uh, what we find about Saul as we're looking into his heart, we're going to see his struggle with what the Bible calls the fear of man. And that may sound like a uh, somewhat dramatic uh, description there, um, but what I want to suggest to you is we all struggle with, with uh, this issue. And in our culture, we call it different things. We talk about peer pressure. We talk about people pleasing. We talk about codependency. You know, we have different names for it, but we all, to one degree or another, struggle with this desire to please uh, people, to find our worth, our identity, our meaning, our purpose in other people, and there are all kinds of problems that, that flow out of it. So our text kind of explores some of these issues around the, uh, the fear of man. And it's not just, of course, a Christian problem, right? Everybody struggles with um, proper boundaries, uh, you know, saying no, saying yes, fears of rejection, uh, trying to seek people's approval. But, uh, you know, everybody's struggling with that. Uh, Melody uh, Beatty actually wrote in her book, Codependent No More, uh, this is interesting. He said, I used to spend so much time reacting and responding to everyone else that my life had no direction. Other people's lives, problems, and wants set the course of my life. And this is exactly what happens to Saul in our text this morning. Other people's desires set the course of his life and ultimately derail his kingship. So we're going to get to explore some of these issues this morning as we uh, dive into our text, and the text is 1 Samuel chapter uh, 15. We're going to be reading the first uh, 29 verses, and then we'll pray and we'll jump over away. If you want a Bible, just slip your hands up. we got some guys will pass out, put those little ESV uh, paperbacks into your hand, and you could follow along with us. Uh, it's page 193 through 194, uh, if you are wanting to follow along. Going to be reading a fairly lengthy text, so it's nice to have God's Word in front of you as we're skipping around from verse to verse. So 1 Samuel 15, going to read the first 29 verses. We'll pray and we'll get started. And Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul so summoned the people and had them numbered them in Talim, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you too with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel. When they came up out of Egypt, so the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatted calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul has came to Carmel and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. And, Saul, and Samuel said to him, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ear and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? 
Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. The Lord, uh, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Let's pray as we dive into God's word this morning. Uh, Father, just very aware this morning how much uh, uh, these words on a page uh, uh, will mean little to us if you are not speaking through your word and through your spirit moving in our hearts. And so I pray this morning um, just that you'd come by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you'd open our eyes to see uh, the things that you would have for us in your word this morning, that you would reveal the struggles that we have with the fear of people, uh, fear of rejection, uh, the desire, that craving for approval. Father, that, that you would begin to convict in our hearts where we need conviction, God, and the goodness of the gospel would free us from all of the ways that we can be in bondage to people's uh, opinions and approval and uh, so many other ways. So would you come this morning uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to your people through your word, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so my aim for this morning's message is that we would be a church that fears God and loves people rather than disregarding God and fearing people. Right? That would be a problem, that we would fear God and love people rather than disregarding God and fearing uh, people. We're going to be looking at Saul again as a case study as we've been doing throughout the course of this series. And if you're taking notes, we're going to be looking at Saul's fight, Saul's fear, and finally Saul's freedom. So, so let's start with Saul's fight this morning. In the first three verses of First Samuel here, um, Saul is tasked with wiping out the Amalekites completely. Right? The Amalekites were uh, something of a scourge of the ancient world, perhaps uh, if you're thinking current events, something like an ancient ISIS. Right? They were running around this kind of nomadic, semi-nomadic group of, you know, something like terrorists who were just kind of running around and just attack, raid, pillage, plunder. And, and that's the kind of nation um, that they were. And so when I Israel came up out of Egypt, the Amalekites ambushed them in the desert, right, as they were struggling, you know, to get their way out of there, struggling with food, water, um, right, as God was providing those things, the Amalekites kind of went a sneak attack to raid, plunder, pillage, and do what, what they do. And so in Deuteronomy 25, we kind of get the historical background on this people, the Amalekites. Uh, Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 19, God says, remember what Amalek did you on the way you 
uh, as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and he cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind, and he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you, for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. And so things haven't changed much with the Amalekites in the few hundred years uh, since the Exodus. And so they're still noted in our text here as notorious sinners. That's uh, right there for you in verse 18. Go devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are uh, consumed. And we also learn something of Agag's war crimes again in verse 33. All the women that he has made or all the, what does it say here, verse um, 33 of our text, um, bring me here Agag, the king of the Am- Ammonites. And Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And so we get just a little flavor of who these uh, Amalekites are and why God is finally going to be bringing uh, punishment against them. And this punishment is um, kind of hard to fathom, hard to even comprehend. It is a total judgment, as you've seen read in our text there, to be totally wiped out from the face of the earth. And Saul is uh, tasked with completing these instructions. However, Saul, um, as has often been the case through our text, has not been very good at following through with listening to the Lord's command. And so in verse 7, uh, we read um, how things actually play out. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, and he took Agag, the king of the Ammonites, alive. And so wait a minute, he's supposed to be destruct, devoted to destruction, he's taken alive and devoted to destruction on the people of the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatted calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. And that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. So Saul has some selective hearing and decides, well, I'm going to keep the best stuff. I'm not going to devote the rest of the stuff to uh, destruction. And so that's where we stand. Saul's given some clear marching orders. He doesn't follow through um, with them. And, and while it's really hard for us, I think, you know, 21st century Americans to wrap our minds around this kind of judgment, a judgment that would require, you know, wiping out a people group. We're just kind of appalled by that. We're kind of disturbed by anything like that in the Bible, particularly when we look at the news and we see uh, genocide going on in other parts of the world. We are, we are utterly appalled by that kind of thing. But what I'd like to suggest to you is this kind of text is very relevant to a very different kind of people. If you are right now living in Syria, if you're right now living in Iraq, and you are a Christian in those parts where your whole family has been butchered, where family members have been crucified, and, and you've been killed, then, then passages that contain judgment really resonate you, with you in a different way than people that are living in relative comfort, affluence, and safety. We find these passages very challenging, very disturbing, but for people that have gone through extreme suffering, pain, privation at the hands of vicious enemies, it's, it's these kind of texts that actually resonate with them. Cries that, that ring true right in uh, Revelation, these, how long, O Lord, is injustice going to reign? How long is this suffering and persecution going to happen? That's the cry of the martyrs in Revelation chapter 6. And, and so we need to hear this text, not just from our 21st century American lenses, but also look at it from the lenses of the oppressed, the marginalized, those that have not received justice, that have died at the edge of the sword and are thinking and crying out for God's deliverance and rescue from enemies like the Amalekites uh, before us. Um, what these kind of texts tell us and the horror of the judgment that God prescribes really is meant to really inform us about the horror of sin, right? Sin by its very nature is destructive and left unchecked, left unregulated. It brings death and destruction and chaos. And uh, just for a living case study, all you have to do is look over at Iraq and Syria right now and other parts of the world like, uh, you know, you know, Somalia or look at, you know, so Sudan, some of these areas that have just been torn by war and strife. And, and you see what happens, right, when sin is just allowed to uh, loose rain. And, and in, in the Bible, there are 
a very few texts, there are not many of them, but there are at least two significant texts right, where we see God's judgment come in a complete way. The one is the flood, of course, you'll remember, back in Genesis 6, God wipes everybody out and starts over except Noah. And the other is then once uh, you know, God sends the people into the promised land and there is this devotion to destruction, there is this total and complete justice that points us forward ultimately to God's final justice when all evil will be eradicated uh, and every thing wrong with this broken and fallen world will be once and for all dealt with and judged. And, and so it's heavy. It's a, it's a weighty, weighty thing to consider the judgment of God this morning, but that's always the corollary to write the good news of the gospel, God's grace, God's mercy, God's kindness to us, right? Also is so meaningful to us because we know the wages of sin is death, and, and that's what awaits those right, who would perpetrate injustice around the world. And in this very unique, very unrepeatable situation, I might say, this is not a mandate for anyone else to go on jihad here. You know, God directly entrusts Saul with carrying out this responsibility. And what a responsibility uh, it is. Um, and if this troubles you, I, I would just say you're not alone, okay? I'm struggling with this text as well. This is a hard text to read. It's a hard text to hear, but we can't just jump over it. It'd be kind of convenient to go to the nice, fun uh, optimistic, great, happy texts. But, you know, it's, it's struggling, it's difficult, it's a challenge, and I would love to sit down and grab coffee if this kind of stuff really disturbs you, you struggle with this. How is this in the Bible? You know, how can this be the Bible if this is in the Bible? You know, how is this different than, you know, XYZ religion that has violence involved with it too? I'd be happy to talk about that, but what's interesting is uh, what disturbs our character in the text is not any of our Western sensibilities, uh, what actually keeps Saul from carrying out this command from God is not squeamish about the violence, as we'll see. Uh, what Saul is dealing with is uh, what we're calling and what the Bible calls the fear of man. That's Saul's problem, and it's this circumstance. So we can have our 21st century problems with the text, and we can wrestle through those as a church and on our communities when we talk through that. But what Saul is wrestling with, our main character, and what the narrator is really working through is this issue of the fear of man, which is interesting. And we've already mentioned that this fear of man, you know, we could talk about it as peer pressure, we could talk about it as people-pleasing, we could talk about it as codependency, we could use some modern labels for it. But what Saul is really wrestling with is this struggle with what the people think. So notice who Saul blames for sparing the livestock, for why he has not carried out God's orders to put everything absolutely to the sword. In uh, verse 15 of chapter 15, um, we read this. Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. And so Saul, as he often does, you know, when he's supposed to be owning responsibility as the king, he manages to push that responsibility off to the people. He blames the people. It was the people that wanted all those animals. And, you know, even though you said to destroy them, they're going to do something good with them. They'll sacrifice them to you or something great like that. And so, you know, it, there's, a, there's a pretense of doing something uh, righteous with these sacrifices, but they are disobeying blatantly the Lord. That's what we see in verse 15. We see this repeated again in verse 21. The, but the people took the spoil, the sheep, the oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice the Lord your God at Gilgal. It's interesting, Saul says the Lord your God, not the Lord our God. You know, your, your God said this, but those people, you know, they're, they're doing the wrong thing. And really the clincher text is verse 24. Saul said to Sam, I've sinned for I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You see, Saul's biggest problem, right, is that he's afraid of the people, right? The people have this desire to take the plunder, to have all these material possessions, because that's what you did in ancient warfare, right? You conquered another people, and then you took all the plunder, and that was kind of the benefit of going through this, you know, bloody warfare, is you get all the goods out of it. That's how it works, and so when God has changed the order and said, look, you're not doing this like to get rich. You're not, you're not taking their wealth so you can get rich. You're doing this to complete a judgment. This has nothing to do with you getting rich, getting affluent. I'll take care of you in that regard. And yet the people desire the plunder. And Saul, as a leader, is not up to the task right, of carrying out what God says. You know, the, the desires of the people are just too much 
for him. He's more concerned with uh, listening to the people than listening to God. He's more concerned with appeasing the people, giving them what they want, than obeying God's uh, command. And so it's, it's a classic illustration of what the Bible calls the fear of man. Let me give you a quick definition. Uh, uh, Alan Snap says this about the fear of man. He says, the phrase fear of man is a biblical category of fear that covers a broad range of preoccupation over what people think of us. The fear of man is when we care too much about what people think of us, and it's a fear that is two-sided. On one side, it's an oversized craving for people's approval, and on the other side, it's an oversized fear of people's rejection. Ultimately, the fear of man puts people in the place of God in our lives, and as such, it for, is a form of idolatry. You see what's going on here, right? With the fear of man, this is an oversized, you know, desire for people's approval, an oversized fear of their rejection. And Saul is wrestling with the latter there. This oversized fear, he doesn't want to be rejected by the people. He wants to please the people. And so instead of pleasing God, he's going to please the people. It's a classic illustration of the fear of the man. Proverbs 29, 25 warns us that the fear of man lays a snare but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And now a snare, if you're not familiar with hunting stuff, is a trap, right, that you set for animals so that you cover it up so when the animals step in it, they're caught. The biblical teaching about the fear of man is what might seem there's nothing harmful about listening to the people or following the people, seeking people's approval or being concerned about their rejection. Uh, Proverbs says it's dangerous, right, when our lives become directed and oriented around pleasing the people uh, around us. And this is doubly true for Saul in our text. He doesn't recognize, right, that this fear of the people is going to cost him his kingdom, right? The stakes are, are very high, and he's totally unaware of what's going on. For, for Saul, God has become very small, and the people's voice has become uh, very large, and so he finds it impossible to deny the people's demands and very easy uh, to not listen to the command of uh, the Lord. And of course, Samuel uh, comes in here in verse 16, and uh, he's having none of these excuses. Um, Samuel says to him as he tries to make excuses about why the people uh, spared the sacrifices and all of that stuff, Samuel says this to Saul. He says, stop. I tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak, and says, Though you were little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. The Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites. Fight against them until they're consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? You can make a lot of excuses. You can try to squirm out of this thing. But here's the real issue. You were not willing to obey the Lord. You obeyed the people rather than obeying the voice of the Lord. Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul says to him, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone on the mission in which the Lord sent me. I brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I've devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people, those people, took the sheep and the oxen and the best of the things to devoted to destruction. Of course, they're going to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, in Gilgal. And Samuel says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is an iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being the king. Hard words, right? And we wonder, really? I mean, is the fear of man, people's approval, is it really that bad? I mean, Gosh, how can, how can the Lord be comparing that with, with divination, like witchcraft, like idolatry, like the two like most flagrant um, commands in the entire Old Testament not to break? And yet, Sam is warning him, that this, this fear of man's approval will lead you down that path. And what's interesting, of course I've cheated and read ahead, is Saul himself does find himself involved in divination and witchcraft later on in the text when we get there. It's a very interesting text. And Saul does find himself in the midst of idolatry um, because the fear of man is it warps our allegiance away from God and towards other people, all right? It begins to direct our hearts away from the true and living God. And Samuel's judgment falls hard on Saul and his kingdom is stripped away. And so this isn't just an ancient problem. This isn't just something Saul struggles with. This is something we struggle with every day, isn't it? To some greater or lesser extent. Some of us are really, really, really big people pleasers, and some of us are, you know, less 
uh, maybe inclined in that direction, but we all struggle in certain ways with this. And uh, Ed Welch's book, When People Are Big and God is Small, a book I highly recommend, he has some great questions here, maybe for your life to evaluate if the fear of man is something that you can identify with. He says this, he says, have you ever struggled with peer pressure? So particularly you teens, uh, kids in the room, right? Have you ever, college students, right? Have you ever struggled with peer pressure? Are you overcommitted? Do you find that it's hard to say no, even when wisdom indicates that you should? Do you need something from your spouse right, that you feel like you can't live without? Um, is self-esteem a critical concern for you? Do you ever feel as if you might be exposed as an imposter? Are you always second-guessing decisions because of what other people might think? Do you feel empty or meaningless? Do you get embarrassed easily? Do you ever lie, especially those little white lies, right, that just kind of try to, you know, manage your persona? Are you jealous of other people? Do other people often make you angry or depressed? Do you avoid people? Uh, do you like to fish for compliments, you know, perhaps even say, you know, self-effacing things just to try and get compliments back at you? Or maybe even the most subtle of them all, when you compare yourself to other people, do you feel pretty good about yourself? Right? You find your meaning and identity by looking at where you stack up to other people. If any of those ring true for you, you may be wrestling with and struggling with the fear of man. Why are we so concerned about peer pressure? Why are we so concerned about what other people think? Uh, I want to suggest to you that uh, as Christians, we recognize, right, it's because we're sinners, right? We're deeply flawed and broken individuals. And so as human beings, right, we have to put a mask on, right? you know, to kind of manage our public persona, right? We've got to kind of hide the things that are really creepy and crazy and weird and out of alignment in our lives to put our best foots forward, right? We want to kind of hide those things, right, that, that could cause us to be rejected, right? We want to put our best traits forward so people will approve of us. Well, you know, give us a pat on the back, say, good boy, good girl, you're doing a great job, right? We, we're always trying to manage that. And of course, you know, you know, we've got to be authentic enough, right, that we, like, share a few of our weaknesses, but, like, not, like, the really big, scary weaknesses that, like, are going to, you know, run people off. So, you know, we're, we're kind of doing that dance, aren't we, between, like, how much can I share that's kind of, like, a little bit edgy, that sounds a little authentic, but people will still recognize that I'm a really good, cool, awesome, wonderful, awesome people, person to be around. And so we're, we're kind of working in that dimension. How do we get free of that, um, of that fear of man, that fear of people, that constant pressure to kind of keep this mask on, keep those walls up so people don't discover who we really are, what we're really uh, about. And, and I want to suggest to you, right, that this is, where, well, this is where Saul's journey should be taking him. Unfortunately for Saul, right, he never seems to be able to get out of this grip of the fear of man. But, but there is hope for Saul, and there's hope, or was hope for Saul, and there's hope for us as well as we wrestle with this question of the fear of man. And so uh, our culture has some great options for trying to break out of this desire for people's approval, right, for this codependency, right? Uh, if you read any of the codependency literature that's out there, they've got a simple solution for the fear of man. Just love yourself more, right? As long as you love yourself, you know, don't build your life around what other people think about you, about what other people say about you, what other people feel about you. You need to just love yourself really, really, really well, and then your self-esteem will go back up and you'll be fine, and then you won't be as as, you know, bound by what other people think and do, and you'll, your, your identity will be established firmly, right, in your own love for yourself, right? And, and as Christians, you know, we, we don't necessarily, that sounds a little too superficial. We go, I don't know, maybe it, it kind of has a bad sound to it, but maybe, you know, what we could do is kind of baptize that in Christian language. Like, you know, maybe if you could just remember how much God loves you, right, then you could, you know, escape the fear of man because you're not going to be then as determined. And there's a lot of truth in that, of course, right? If we could, you know, just really appreciate the love of God for us, we wouldn't be searching for it in all these other places. And so there's a great amount of truth to that claim. And, uh, you know, you can't hardly undersell the love of God. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. But there is a problem, of course, with just simply uh, bringing uh, more self-esteem to ourselves, whether it's esteem from God or esteem from others. And, and Ed Welch gets at this in his book, and I thought this was very insightful. The problem, he says, is it still allows us and our needs to be at the center of the world, and God becomes our psychic errand boy, given the task of inflating 
our self-esteem, which actually can make our problems worse, right? When we stay at the center of the universe and our self-esteem is all important, we're willing to trample everyone else in the pursuit of maintaining our own self-esteem, right? Because if our self-esteem, if our self-worth is the most important thing in the world and, and that's the most important thing we need to do, right, then we're going to put everyone else as number two in our priority list so that we can protect our self-esteem and make sure it doesn't go down. And that means we're going to constantly use people, manipulate people, and, you know, do any number of other obnoxious things, right, so that we can maintain our self-esteem, right? That's why we have a whole generation uh, that's, you know, entitled, right? We have this great word out there, all these entitled millennials, you know, all they want is like think everything should be handed to them, think everything should be there, you know, they have, they've been taught this self-esteem thing their entire lives, that they're a snowflake, they're unique, they're wonderful, they can do whatever they want, and then they don't want to actually work or do anything, and, you know, they've got this great self-esteem, but they don't want to actually work, and, and so uh, the problem here, this loving yourself more has actually not solved the problem, it's actually compounded the problem, because now people are thinking, I got to take care of myself. And then everyone else is thinking the same thing. I got to build up my self esteem, and often at the expense of others. And so we find ourselves in a worse position than we began by simply adding to our self esteem. What I want to suggest to you is that hope is actually found in the opposite direction. This is very counterintuitive, but, but bear with me here. What I want to suggest to you is that hope is actually found in recognizing that we're sinners, that we're inadequate, that we're broken, that we're deeply flawed. That's where our freedom can actually come. Ed Welch says it like this. He said, it's the paradox of low self-esteem. Low self-esteem usually means that I think too highly of myself. Now, now what Ed Welch is trying to get at here is that as long as we hold on to the idea that you have what it takes to save yourself, you know, if you just love yourself more, you know, if you just build up your self-esteem, you know, you can, you, can, you can take care of yourself. You're thinking too highly of yourself. You're putting yourself in the place of God. Like, I've got what it takes to build my esteem. I've got what it takes to build my identity. I've got what it takes to build meaning into my life. So ironically, uh, low self-esteem could actually be too high of a view of ourselves where true hope, Christian hope, comes in acknowledging our sin and in finding a Savior. Right? That, that's where, it's when you get to rock bottom, it's when you get to the sin, you recognize, I don't have what it takes to fix myself, right? That you can finally be liberated, that you can finally recognize the freedom that comes from God. And that's why uh, the Bible offers an alternative to the fear of man. Uh, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom in Proverbs and in uh, Ecclesiastes, the conclusion there, fearing God and keeping His commandments is the whole duty of man you see, the Bible wants us to reorient away from this fear of man to the fear of the Lord, right? That's where the true hope is. That's where true rescue is found, right? When we get to the end of ourselves and finally are able to turn to God. And we see in our text, Samuel has that, right? He's willing to pray to God, ask God to rescue the people. We see it in Jonathan last week as he's willing to you know, take a risk for God because of who God was, he was going to step out. We're going to see that in David, of course. He's got this fear of the Lord. But Saul, this is a character quality that he is totally lacking. And he's got every reason to fear God, doesn't he? God has anointed him as the king. God has rescued him from the Ammonites and the Philistines. And now he's given a victory over the Amalekites. You would think this would be a guy that would recognize right? It's not about the people, it's about God. God is the one variable that makes Israel Israel. He's the one that's protected us, he's the one that's delivered us, he's the one that's been our God. We're going to trust him, and yet his, vi his vision, like our vision, often it, it gets off of the true and living God and gets onto the people around us. Despite God's uh, salvation repeated over and over again, Saul continually finds himself back where he started again in this fear of man, and this genuinely grieves God's heart. It's one of the unique points about this text here in verse 11. Uh, we see this interesting little line here I regret that I made Saul king, for he's turned back from following me, has not performed my commands. You're like, can God really have regret? Like, that's kind of a strange thing uh, to say in the midst of a text. I mean, uh, you know, God's like sovereign, He's in control, everything He wants to happen happens. You know, how could God have regret? What I want you to see here is our narrator's trying to, trying to um, communicate the genuine sorrow 
God has over Saul's sin. Right? This regret is a genuine sense of, man, things have gone horribly wrong for Israel and in Saul's life, and it's a genuine tragedy. And so the author uses one of these really nice big seminary words called anthropomorphism, or anthropopathism, depending on what you want to do, where you know, human characteristics or human feelings are given to God to help us really understand uh, the mystery of how God relates to the world, right? And so we're given this, this expression here, you know, that, that the Lord mourned over Saul or he regretted making Saul king. Different translations use different words. Um, we're given a little bit of God's heart. Uh, but it's interesting, in the middle of our very text, our narrator is using this word in two different ways, that God's grief uh, for Saul's folly is deliberately contrasted with his unchanging nature. And so we see in verse 29, and also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. And you go, wait a minute, does the Lord regret that he made Saul king or does he not regret? You're, what's going on here, right? There's, there's a tension in the text and our narrator is deliberately using this word, right, two different ways, right? Unless we just want to say he's outright contradicting himself in the very same chapter. No, what he's doing here is he's creating a tension here, right, between God's love for lost, broken sinners and also God's love for his own nature, his own character, his perfect nature. He doesn't change. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't ever go back on his promises or on his word. These two uh, verses stand in tension in the text, waiting uh, a resolution. And what I want to suggest to you is that tension that emerges in our text between God's sorrow over our sin and also God's commitment to his own justice, his own uh, authority, his own rule is only relieved in the gospel where God's love and God's justice meet at the cross. Because God is grieved over our sin, just as he's grieved over the sins of Saul, God sent Jesus to come right, and to rescue us, to take our place on the cross Right, to take our sin upon himself um, so that we could then receive his righteousness. And in this great exchange of the gospel, what God does is he upholds his love uh, for his people that are lost in sin, and at the same time he upholds his justice because sin must be punished. Right? The wages of sin is death. That must be carried out. And so he carries out that justice upon his son. That's the good news of the gospel for us, right? That Jesus took our sins upon himself so we don't have to pay for them. And then Jesus gave us his perfect righteousness. And the way that changes the way we relate to people is this, right? If you recognize in your life that the sin, the shame, the, the brokenness, the pain, the suffering in your life, in your past, all of those things, they don't define you anymore because they've been covered by the cross by Jesus' death, right? Those failures don't have to define you. Those failures don't have to, you don't have to fear rejection from other people because Jesus was already rejected for you. Jesus has already taken your punishment. He's taken your shame. He's taken your guilt. You, you don't have to bear that. You don't have to live by what other people think about you. And the other side of the gospel is this. You don't have to live for people's approval because you now, as a child, a son, daughter of the king, right, you get Jesus' righteousness. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. And so you don't have to look for approval elsewhere. You have the approval of the God of the universe. You have his acceptance. He's, he's speaking life into you and the beauty of the gospel is how it how it resolves these tensions and allows us to move away from this paralysis that we get when we fear rejection from other people or this constant chasing approval from other people the gospel breaks those processes down i love how tim keller says this because it really sums the gospel up so well he says the gospel is this we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared to believe yet at the very same time we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared to hope. Isn't that beautiful, right? right? Hope lies in the direction of recognizing that our brokenness goes deeper than we thought. Our sin goes deeper than we thought, but God's love goes deeper than we could ever imagine. Uh, I love what Jack Miller used to say to the professors at Westminster Seminary. He used to say, cheer up, you're a worse sinner than you know. You know cheer up about that, but God loves you more than you can imagine, right? You know, you know don't mope, don't live in that. 
You know, live in the reality of, yes, your brokenness is addressed by the grace of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus. And so your acceptance can be rooted in that. You don't have to fear uh, the rejection from other people. Jesus has already done that for you. The fear of man leads us to this fear of God, what he's going to do on behalf of humanity to reconcile us to God through Jesus. That's what breaks the power of the fear of man. It's the gospel of Jesus. So what would it look like to wake up Monday morning and start your week focused on fearing God rather than fearing people, right? Think about all the people in your life right now, your bosses, your teachers, your, all the people that are in a position of authority that you're trying to like please. And uh, think about all the people maybe that you're fear, you know, worried about rejection, being rejected from. And what would it look like to focus rather than on them and how you can please them, how you can kiss up to them, how you can you know, do whatever it is you do, how you could be focused on fearing God and just loving them, right? Rather than trying to use them, manipulate them. You know, what would it look like to really uh, fear God rather than fearing them? What would it look like to start your week out uh, building up your esteem for God rather than your own self-esteem, right? To, to just get your eyes off of yourself and just to look at who your God is. It's not enough for you to sit here Sunday morning and hear this beautiful message of the gospel. What would it look like for you to preach the gospel to yourself Monday morning, to begin to get your eyes off of yourself and get your eyes on who God is and what he's done in your life, to spend some time reorienting, resending yourself. What would it look like Monday morning uh, to focus on loving people rather than fearing them or using them, right? That's where it tends to go, right? We, we, we tend to find ourselves in this spectrum of attempting to get approval out of people or fearing people, depending on who they're. And finally, what would it look like to freely share your faith this week rather than fearing what people will think of you? Or isn't that the most painful evidence of the fear of man? Like, you're, oh, I got to go out there and tell people about Jesus. Like, yeah, try, try to do that and you will immediately discover what the fear of man is, right? As you're confronted with looking at these people and um, the opportunities you have to share about Jesus, what would it look like as you are meditating who God is, what he's like, to be able to share freely about what God has done um, not to try to get acceptance from other people or out of fear of rejection, but just because of the love that God has poured out in your life. Followers of Jesus fear God and love people rather than disregarding God and fearing people. Let's pray. Uh, Father, a very practical message this morning and one in which we can all really uh, identify with in different ways. And, and I pray as we gather on the table right now, uh, Father, that that the gospel would come home to us, where your love and your justice meet at the cross, as we consider your body broken for us, your blood shed for us, as we remember uh, Jesus, would he loom larger in our lives, would Jesus would be big, and uh, the people in our lives, would they become increasingly smaller? Would you set us free from the fear of man this morning, fear of people's refusion, the fear of rejection, and all of the ways that that works itself out in our lives? God, would this be a moment of just liberation? And then as we walk this out in communities together, um, God, would you make us a church that really fears God and is about his agenda, his kingdom, his plan? We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.